Hello, hello everybody. I'm so happy this day has finally come. And at least for now, the weather is cooperating. I'm Gary Edelman of the American Battlefield Trust. We've got Chris White behind the camera, who you'll see in just a second. And we are at our first deep into West Virginia. I don't know, some people would call this not super deep. Romney, West Virginia. It was Virginia at this time. And Romney really figured prominently um, in the early portions of West Virginia in 1861 and 1862. Chris is gonna tell you about that uh, as well as where we're standing. I'll just say that as you're going through West Virginia, you start to see one thing right away. Virginia Civil War trail signs. You see these signs everywhere. So when you take your trip through West Virginia, make sure you stop and see the Civil War trail signs. Civil War trails, there's always something cool to see and do along the trail. I'm going to grab the camera from Chris now, and Chris, take it away. Now that we've done our fire drill. <laughs> uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we're in Romney, West Virginia. At the time of the American Civil War, when this kicks off in 1861, we're actually standing in Virginia. This is Hampshire County, Virginia to be specific, and it was founded in 1762. We're in the hamlet of Romney, which was about 500 people in 1861. Um, and Romney is a really interesting place to come to. There's a lot of myth around Romney, what happens here during the American Civil War. It allegedly changes hand, hands 56 different times. The truth of the matter is it probably changes hands about a dozen times. Now, do you count whenever two guys showed up here to water their horses as changing hands between the two sides, the Union and Confederates? You know, that's, you can get 56 times, but most likely it's about 12. But Romney itself is, as I said, a hamlet. It's about 500 people here in 1861. Why is it important? Well, one of the reasons is what you're hearing right behind Gary holding the camera, and that is the Northwestern Turnpike. The Northwestern Turnpike, which runs through here to this day, uh, is going to take you from Winchester, Virginia, which is about 40 miles away from here. We were through Winchester this morning, and it'll take you out to Parkersburg in 1861, Virginia, today, West Virginia. Parkersburg is right on the Ohio River. You can cross into Ohio, up into Marietta, and other places like that. So this is a major thoroughfare that will take you up into western Virginia in 1861. So the idea behind coming to Romney is going to be uh, a, a variety of reasons. Because, as we know, West Virginia becomes a state on June 20th of 1863. But to get to statehood, West Virginia is going to need backing of the Federal Army and it's also going to need protection for its politicians. And to get those 34 counties that initially want to become West Virginia, that safety, you are going to have to protect it from the Confederates. And one of those, one of those ways to get into the Confederacy will be, <coughs> I'm sorry, right into the Union, uh, Virginia, will be right here along the Northwestern Turnpike. So what are we going to do? We're going to try to take Romney. Some of the first troops that come through here will be commanded by Nathaniel Banks and Lew Wallace. Lew Wallace, Ben-Hur author, made famous by the Battle at Monocacy, made famous by the Battle at Shiloh. They'll be here for a while. But when does it become prominent during the American Civil War? What do most Civil War buffs know about? It's not the 22nd Pennsylvania Cavalry who spends a lot of time here, known as the Ringgold Cavalry. It's going to be because of one man, and that is Stonewall Jackson. Stonewall Jackson is going to focus on Romney starting in late 1861. Jackson is going to be sent out to Winchester, Virginia, and his goal is to, or his, his orders, are to protect the Shenandoah Valley. Winchester is off in that direction by about 40 miles. When Jackson arrives in Winchester, he finds a bunch of militia, two cannon, a handful of cavalry. He really doesn't have a substantial force to defend the valley. He is going to call upon Judah Benjamin, who is the Secretary of War at this time for the Confederates, to send him anyone and everyone that he can. He'll get the old Stonewall Jackson Brigade. The Stonewall Brigade will come to him to, in Winchester. They're going to call out into Western Virginia, today West Virginia, and call back an Army of the Northwest under the command of William Wing Loring. Uh, Loring's a very interesting character we'll talk about here in a second. And Jackson will eventually put together a force around Winchester of about 7,000 Confederate soldiers, maybe 2,000 militiamen, uh, some artillery pieces. So he's going to put together in Winchester a fairly substantial force. What he also now wants to do, is potentially as Jackson wants to do, is to try to draw some attention into the Shenandoah Valley so that Joseph Johnston, who is his overall commander at this time, not Robert E. Lee, over in the Centerville Manassas area can have some of the pressure maybe pulled off of him, maybe lure 
uh, George McClellan into a battle by all the actions we'll take out here. Jackson can swing in on his flank like he, he will be so want to do throughout the entire war. And we can end this thing. Maybe. That's the idea. It's not going to come to fruition. A lot of moving parts will take place. So if we'll look down here at our map, what we start to see is we have Jackson down here at Winchester. He decides what he wants to do is expand out his perimeter. He's worried about Union forces that are up in Hancock, Maryland to the north. He's worried about Union forces in Bath, uh, which is today in West Virginia. And he's also worried about federal forces here in Romney. So what he wants to do, Stonewall Jackson, is expand his perimeter outward up to essentially the Potomac River, if not across the Potomac River, where he can have more security for his base of operations in the valley at Winchester. So Jackson decides in December of 1862, or December of 1861, he's going to go and take on the uh, Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. His men will tear up about 100 miles of tracks, but there's also the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. So he has to take care of that. He's going to go to a place called Dam Number 5. His guys are going to work for days on trying to destroy Dam Number 5 so that the water level will be thrown off on the canal. And he does a great job. They start to damage Dam Number 5. But the Union forces come in after Jackson leaves, and they fix it within just a few days. So that didn't exactly work. So what Jackson decides to do now is that he's going to start taking out federal outposts. The Federals in this area are under the overall command of Nathaniel Banks. Banks is actually one of the highest ranking officers in the Federal Army, only behind Winfield Scott and George McClellan. Nathaniel Banks is a political general through and through, and he is going to set up a perimeter using Bath, Hancock, and Romney, and he is going to try and hold this perimeter with these little outposts. So what Jackson wants to do is take out these individual outposts one at a time, occupy them, and then when the weather gets better, he is going to be able to attack the federal forces maybe up into Maryland and undertake those that plan that I told you about to draw pressure off of Joe Johnston. So what, what, what are we going to do? January 1st, 1862, in a new year, Jackson's going to start a new campaign. He's going to start moving towards Bath. Beautiful day. It's warm, sunny, everything's going well, and then a wind comes across. A western wind is going to carry across this area, and it's going to start to bring in snows. It's going to start to bring in freezing rain, and what ends up happening in this area it becomes very difficult to maneuver. Men will move up into the area of Bath. The Confederates will take it after a comedy of errors. And then they will eventually move up towards Hancock, Maryland, which is a major supply depot for the Union forces. It's under, oh, under the overall command of a guy named uh, Lander, Frederick Lander, who you can see right over here. And my apologies, I showed Lander earlier instead of Loring. So Lander is a, uh, New ha or, I'm sorry, a Salem, Massachusetts native. He's from spooky Salem, Massachusetts, where they had the witch trials. And he's also a Norwich graduate, Norwich University today. That's my, one of my alma maters. And Lander is going to be down here in this area. Very aggressive commander. He's fought in the Western campaigns so far in Western Virginia at places like Philippi and Rich Mountain, which we'll visit later on. And Lander is also going to um, be a thorn in the side, Phil Carney-esque of George McClellan. He's always going to be telling him, we should be attacking Stonewall Jackson. He's attacking us. Let's attack him. Take the fight to him. Nathaniel Banks and George McClellan like, whoa, 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 you can't tell us those types of things. And they actually censure him for wanting to go on the offensive. So Lander, who's up in Hancock, Maryland, is just seething. On oh, the Potomac River, it's flood stage at this point. It's a nasty with, with the snows and the rains coming across. And this little boat comes across the river on the first week of January. And it's carrying Turner Ashby. Colonel Turner Ashby becomes famous under Stonewall Jackson. Ashby gets out of his boat comes over to Lander and says, Stonewall Jackson gives you two hours to give up Hancock, Maryland. Lander says he can have this place if he wants it because there's more sesh here than there's anything else for the Union. But then Lander is going to blow up, scream at Ashby for a while, and then basically tell him to pound sand and go back across the river. And then he thought better of this and he said, no, Jackson came to me with this, with this offer. Let me be military about it. Let me be manly about it. I'll send back an, an, uh, a message to him. And he basically says, Stonewall Jackson, if you want this, you can come and take it. Jackson can't do it. He's going to try to build a bridge up river. Doesn't work. And he's going to fall back to a place called Unger's Store. And this march back to Unger's Store is just terrible. It's falling below 
uh, for, it's below zero March, it's icy roads, guys are slipping and sliding. One Confederate said that if a man didn't fall two times during this march on these icy roads, that he wasn't part of this march. Horses are falling down. Jackson gets off his horse and tries to help, at least on two occasions, to push a wagon as well as an artillery battery down the road. So Jackson, things don't seem to be going well for him. But he gets word that Romney, his goal for the to secure his left flank from Winchester is going to be open because in the great McClellan fashion, McClellan orders Banks to pull out of here. Frederick Lander is just seething. He rides into Romney and he is going to start chewing out every person he sees. He blows up on the chaplain of the 14th Indiana. He is going to push the 22nd Pennsylvania Cavalry so hard because the river here, the South Fork of the Potomac's here in, in Romney, he's going to start pushing men across this raging torrent that 16 horses get washed away in this torrent. Lander is just seething. They think he's drunk. He's actually just angry. But Lander is going to pull his men back, and Jackson finds out all of a sudden, Romney's wide open. We're good to go. So he's going to send his men over here. He will establish his headquarters in the house behind me. That's the John White house. The White family, who I'm not related to this branch of it, uh, is very prominent here in Romney. A lot of politicians, a lot of local uh, ties here, the White family. He is going to establish his headquarters here, and everything seems to be going well for Stonewall Jackson. He's at least taken Bath like he wanted. He has taken Romney. He is not able to go across the Potomac River, but he has expanded out his uh, cordon of operations, or his area of operations. Now Jackson's going to take his Stonewall Brigade back to Winchester. He, the two of them go, the, the two go back to Winchester, and as they do this, there's jeers. William Wing Loring and his men who were stuck here in Romney are very upset. They're going to describe this place as a hog pen. They're going to describe it as one of the worst corners of the earth. Now if we pan down this way, you can see Romney is much prettier than you would think. But in 1862, remember, there are Union forces, Confederate forces coming up and down this area. There's rains, there's snows, it turns into mud. The Federals had left behind $60,000 worth of goods, but much of them are rotting down in the courthouse. They had hung meat up there. It smells awful here. William Wing Loring and his men are not happy. Now, just for a second, let's talk about Loring. Loring is an old Army officer who did not graduate from West Point. He's born in North Carolina. His family moves down to Florida. At the age of about 14, he tries to slip off to Texas to fight in the Texas Revolution, but his parents catch him. He does go off to fight in the Seminole Wars, the Mexican-American War. He fights on the plains against the Native, Ameri uh, Native Americans. This guy's seen a lot of action. He's part of the Great Camel Experiment in the, in the uh, Federal Army prior to this. He's part of the Mormon Expedition. He's even, he's even a colonel, one of 19 colonels in the United States Army when this, when this uh, war breaks out. He outranks Stonewall Jackson. He outranks Robert E. Lee in the old army. But now here in the valley, he is taking orders from Stonewall Jackson. He doesn't like it. Loring, very testy guy, has some testy officers under him. A guy named Samuel Fulkerson of the 37th uh, Virginia and a guy named William Tolliver. It's spelled Tolly of Pharaoh, but it's pronounced Tolliver. These three get together they start to think about what can they do about their situation here in Romney. They don't like Stonewall Jackson, who's 40 miles away, they think comfortably in Winchester. He's taken his pets with him, that's the Stonewall Brigade, and they've left these three brigades of Loring up here just languish. So, Fulkerson drafts a letter, a petition as it were, to start talking to, to the politicians in Richmond to tell them of the woeful state of the Army of the Northwest here in Romney and how Stonewall Jackson has left them out here to dry and to hang dry. They're upset. Fulkerson and Tolliver take this to Loring. Loring loves this petition and everyone starts to sign this petition around them except for the Tennessee units that are up here as well as the artillery. But this is known as the Romney petition and this is going to go all the way down to Richmond. It's going to go in front of first Vice President Alexander Stevens, who's like, man, what's going on in Romney? This Stonewall Jackson guy's crazy. Then they go to Judah Benjamin, who's the Secretary of War. Judah Benjamin is like, oh man, this isn't going well. And it goes in front of Jefferson Davis. 
it did not go in front of Joseph Johnston, who is the commander of Jackson. They've usurped the chain of command, jumped the chain of command, and now have put it right in the commander-in-chief's lap. Unbeknownst, really, to Joe Johnston, and only known to Stonewall Jackson because this petition was sent to him, and then down to Richmond, they did follow that little chain of command, uh, which he does not like. He makes some notes on it about how this was not approved. And now Stonewall Jackson is ordered directly from the president of the Confederacy to withdraw Loring's force, order them back to Winchester. All right, so Stonewall Jackson says, fine, what are we going to do now? I'm going to think about some things. I'm going to go off in Winchester, write a few letters. Who do we write to? We write to John Letcher. He's the governor of Virginia. If you can go to politicians, I can play that game too. This letter arrives down in Governor Letcher's office. Stonewall Jackson has decided, I'm resigning from the Confederate service. Send me back to the Virginia Military Institute. There I will go and be a teacher again. All right. This doesn't sit well with Letcher, who's a very quiet man. He actually goes over, corners Judah Benjamin, chews him out, gets in front of the president, talks to him about it, and now Davis and Benjamin realize they both have made a massive error. At the same time, Letcher's running around screaming about Stonewall Jackson, calling him a crazy man. He's a crazy man. What is he thinking? That's legitimately what he said about him. So now, Letcher has called Davis. He's called Benjamin on their bluffs. And now, so is Stonewall Jackson. Jackson will meet with a man named Alexander Boatler, the Boatler family name might be familiar to you. At Shepherdstown, they had Boatler's Ford. Boatler's from Shepherdstown, which is the uh, oldest town, along with Romney, in what becomes West Virginia, both founded in 1762. And now Boatler comes up there and says, basically, look, they screwed up. Will you withdraw your, your resignation? Stonewall Jackson, after some huffing and puffing, decides, yes, I will withdraw my my. my uh, resignation, but I'll do you one better. Now, I'm going to level charges against William Wing Loring and these others. What do we have now? A problem created by the President and the Secretary of War. There will be no court-martial for Loring. Why? Because they don't want it to become public how much they've screwed up. So they'll transfer Loring back into Western Virginia, and Loring will campaign down on the Kanawha, down around Charleston and some other areas. We'll talk about him later. Jackson will get his command back, as well as Loring's command, Tolliver, Fulkerson, and others who have stabbed him in the back. He won't censure Tolliver, he won't censure Fulkerson, but every time they came to the headquarters of the Army Valley, Valley uh, the Army of the Valley, they will be, receive a very, very cold welcome. Romney's given up, but Romney really was not a great prize, let's be honest. This was Stonewall Jackson wanting to do something during a winter campaign to keep his men on the march. Over the next few years, though, Romney will change hands between the Confederates and the Union. John McClausen, during his 1864 raid up into Pennsylvania, when he goes to burn uh, Chambersburg, he'll make his, men, make his way back through here. And his men will go down towards Moorfield, where they are attacked on August 7th of 1864, about 30 miles south of here, by William Woods Averill, who we'll talk about at Droop Mountain. We'll also have a fort built on the other side of the river where we're standing. Uh, fort Mill, great fort, 54th Pennsylvania, as well as the 1st West Virginia. Uh, Union Infantry will build a fort over there. You can go visit. There are Civil War trail signs over in that area. You can go visit those as well. Civil War trails. There's always something cool to see and do along the trail. We need to come up with a, a promo for them that we flash across the screen. Um, you can come here and allegedly see the first Confederate monument placed in, in September of 1867. There are a lot of first Confederate monuments. There are a lot of first Union monuments. Romney says that they had their first monument. It's up in Indian Mount Cemetery, um, about a mile down the road from where we're standing. And there are some other Civil War trail signs around here, down in front of the courthouse, the Hampshire County Courthouse which eventually becomes, uh, goes from Virginia into West Virginia. Uh, and they have some signs down through here in Romney that will show you some of the historic sites, um, including Stonewall Jackson's headquarters when he's here. I like this sign because he regarded Romney highly enough to resign from the army when ordered to fall back from the town. Later he reconsidered. It's not Romney 
why he resigns. It's the usurping of the chain of command and his authority. Stonewall Jackson sees the world in black and white. No pun intended, there's no gray area in his life. Uh, and he saw this as a slight against him, slight against his army, and he was out of here. It has less to do with Romney as a town, more to do with Stonewall Jackson, his ego, as well as what he perceived as, as a slight from Jefferson Davis and Judah P. Benjamin. So if you come out here to Romney, there's some great things to see. Uh, and we unfortunately don't have enough time to cover everything on this trip because we have to make our way off to Corex, Ford, Philippi, uh, Rich Mountain, and many other places in between. Gary, anything you want to add? Yeah, I just want to uh, say hello to everybody that's been watching. Uh, you're with the American Battlefield Trust, and we've seen some of our good old friends, Tom Boyce and Kerr Bell and Jamie Reif uh, and, uh, and Cameron Mallow. We're in your country, finally, uh, Mr. West Virginia over there, and, uh, and really happy to have Civil War Trails themselves on. So, Chris, thanks for that awesome opening. I hope you're catching the other videos we're posting uh, with Dennis Fry around Harper's Ferry. Join us throughout the day. We'll go live when we can, and we'll be around for several days after that at Places Unspecified. Thanks for watching, and thanks for supporting Battlefield Preservation.